My name is Albert Leikoff. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Art and Wood. This is a 22nd year for the Wingate IT International Residency Program. To participate, you have to apply. It's a very competitive application process. We have a selection committee that reviews applications from all over the world, and not just artists. There are six international artists working together along with a photojournalist and a scholar. This is the second year that we have a student as part of the program. And it really started off this year with a challenge because we lost the facility of UArts. They had a major flood and the building was closed down by the city. So literally at the 11th hour, we had to find a new location. And that attributes to, I believe, the uniqueness of this exhibition. Don't do that. Don't do that. Doctor, are you? Don't do that. Wait. We formed a partnership with NextFab, which is a maker's community facility in South Philadelphia. And they have this state of the art, not just woodworking equipment, but the photo lab and the print lab and the computer lab. We still partner with the University of Arts in utilizing their dorms, which is a great asset because it's right in the heart of the city. It wasn't that far from NextFab the residency fellows they had set their mind in working in a beautiful state-of-the-art woodworking shop at UArts. But then when they found out about this, it really threw them for a loop in a good way. And I think it's reflected in this show. Thank you, Albert. Hi, my name is Samuel Budin. I am the 2017 ITE resident photojournalist, born and raised just outside of New York City. In my practice, I generally use slide film and make and present slideshows. I studied music in high school, studied writing in college, and took up photography after that. And I find that that medium and presentation style affords me an opportunity to synthesize those three strains of my practice. Slide processing is not readily available in Philadelphia. I wanted to take the opportunity to deepen my relationship with traditional photographic methods. I'm allergic to darkroom chemicals, but I got a good respirator and I was able to process and print black and white film for the first time successfully. And I put together a photo album. Photo albums were my first photo books. Before I knew I had any interest in photography, I looked through the ones my parents put together and I tried to recreate that mode of storytelling, both on the blog and in my piece for the show, which is a photo album called Familiar Alternatives. This is a Pioneer PMV206 magnetic photo album, same as my mother used to use. I've known Daniel since we were 18. It was a real pleasure to be able to spend the summer with him and see him working on projects that are new to me since he's been in San Diego. I just like watching Max turn. He's so fluid on the lathe, and there's nothing about the process that seems to be mysterious to him. If there are things he's figuring out, I wouldn't know by watching him. I like being able to collaborate with Anastasia on the written part of her project. She's been really working on this one project consistently the whole time. I think I almost have the clearest sense of how it took shape and fit together because I watched each piece be made Megan's a little bit mysterious because she wasn't always working in the space with the rest of us, but I had a really pleasant afternoon trying to photograph the laser cutter in action and also seeing her pieces come together, the light boxes. It was really cool. Jason's work I love because it's so graphically interesting on its own with the different textures of cardboard. It made it really easy to photograph. I never went into NextFab without taking a picture of Jason's table. If you guys were a jury, who would you have elected as your foreman? Is this a civil? Criminal. Criminal. <laughs> Felicia, she's the most level-headed. She's the facilitator. She's the social glue that held our group together. And I always had a lot of fun visiting her at the CNC station and seeing what she was milling. My name is Felicia Francine Dean. Uh, born and raised in Boca Raton, Florida, and now living out of Greensboro, North Carolina.
The residency has been great, getting along with other people. I try to keep everything pretty calm and cool. We've had these meals in the dorms, which has been great. I've had great experiences out visiting places. So a lot of my work looks at fashion apparel, fabric manipulation techniques. It's really rooted in that and soft systems and or upholstery, textiles and fibers. A lot of inspiration from the fashion design industry in regards to form and making. I experiment with all types of materials from wood, which this residency did really afford me to focus on that more, in addition to natural dyes, fiberglass at times. My work is a process driven by experimentation with materials, sometimes letting them drive the actual form or design itself, sometimes trying to constrain them and work with them also. What I've done with the residency is I've allowed myself to experiment more with using the work I've done previously and bring it into a context of wood objects. How can I showcase wood as a material but in a different way? One of the works that I'm most excited about that I've been working on two and a half years prior to this is this influence of millinery, which is hat making. Understanding the process of that making and using that process to develop forms for sculpture and furniture design. Previously, I had turned a lot of items, and those items have now become works that I've scanned and edited and used to create one solid piece. So before, they were modular parts that I would stack together, and now that can be turned on a CNC indexer, which is basically like a lathe on a computer numeric controlled machine. I'm able to use that millinery process of making and form over that with a naturally dyed material to create an offspring piece from that solid wood piece. So that's been really one of my favorite parts here in all of the computer design work and hand work that I've included in my exploration here. In the studio, it was really nice. I worked next to Max, and we had quite a bit of dialogue together about process, and other people too, and it's been interesting to hear the exchange and the overlap of each other's work. Seeing people produce, we begin to see the connection that maybe the board who chose us saw that connection. Even though we're all so diverse, we definitely have some similarities. I see that you and Max made a piece together. Was that fun? Yeah, it was really great, actually. He works primarily with his hands. I work a lot with digital media and digital making. We began to think about how we could bring our work together. and So yeah, we worked on a piece where it's hand and CNC milled. I think, honestly, fabric forms which I produced were really relevant to his forms, dealing with the ocean and the beach and so forth. Very soft surfaces, very calming, and it worked really well in one final piece. Hi, I'm actually Batman. Hi, <laughs> I'm Max Brosey from Northwest Ireland. My background originally was in furniture design and I worked on that for several years till I got a bit bored by the linear quality of the furniture I was making and I decided to turn to hollow wooden surfboards. And I was combining my love of the sea and of working with wood. But unfortunately at that time the recession kicked in in Ireland and it didn't go very well. Maybe for the last 15 years I've been wood turning and last five of that quite seriously. I found it a great outlet for making more sculptural work where you can express your thoughts much more than in furniture. I was very lucky that when I started off, I immediately started doing uh, multi-axis work because it was a way of expressing my ideas for geometric shapes. It took off from there. My pieces prior to this residency, they've been very industrial masculine forms turned from green wood. As it dries, it warps and twists and contorts, which is a really nice contrast to the starkness of the original form. And oftentimes I combine it with rusty steel, the iron in the steel really sparks off with the tannins in the oak and it causes blue stain and rust and it's an interesting contradiction in materials. Coming to this residency what I wanted to do was create a new body of work that was more tactile, more curvaceous if you like, simple vessel forms because it's not something I've explored before but they had to be relevant to my previous body of work so everything I've done in one way or another is based on the coast of Ireland. So these vessels I did on this residency, they're based on beach pebbles I saw as a teenager and as a kid while I was beach combing and playing in rock pools and so on. All the textures I use, I sandblast everything. Although it's not directly derived from it, 
it's loosely based on driftwood and the way the rust leaches into the wood is like an old boiler off a ship that was washed up on a beach and the rust stains the rocks and the driftwood and it's all these natural textures that's why i don't use finish i try to keep it as natural and honest as possible what's become more and more important to me in my work is that there's signs of hands at work so that there are tool marks left that you can tell it was a human that made these pieces Roughly a year and a half ago I had an accident, an indoor rock climbing accident where I fell 26 foot and broke my wrist, elbow and two heels. After that I had a period of almost a year where I wasn't doing very much work because I couldn't physically do it. But when I did come back my pieces had morphed into more curvy, easy forms, less tubular and less harsh if you like. And that was a totally subconscious thing, it wasn't intentional at all. I have pieces like my whalebone forms which resemble the vertebrae of whale washed up on the beach in Ireland that I saw as a kid but those weren't curvy enough for me yet so that's why I went to Vessels for this, this residency. Another interesting outcome of this residency has been that I can see a very clear need in me to have both lines of work simultaneously. One, the Vessels they are very centred and simple forms, very calm, whereas sometimes my multi-axis sculptures. They're conceptual, they have stories behind them, they're larger, they're bolder in a way. So I like to switch from one to the other as my personality dictates. I did not know that there was a big surfing community in Ireland. Were you a surfer? I was in my teenage years, yeah. I've kind of fallen out of it now. Myself and my wife, we do a lot of sea kayaking and stand-up paddleboarding. When I was a kid growing up, I was always in the sea, whether it was diving, sailing, snorkeling or spearfishing. A mentor of mine, a stone and glass artist from Germany who had a holiday home in Ireland, his name is Lothar Goebel. As a teenager he always brought me along to the local storm beaches to find perfectly symmetrical elliptical beach pebbles which he'd cut in half and sandwich a piece of plate glass in between and polish off the plate glass. That informed my design aesthetic and I developed an eye for these elliptical shapes. Those whole textures that I use in all of my work, they all came from seeing those things when I was a little child. I'm Megan McGlynn, and I'm from Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Did you and Max form kind of an Irish mafia? <laughs> I tried, but he wasn't into it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the experience socially like at the residency? I was actually very pleasantly surprised at how well we all got along. It's hard to get seven strangers together and have everybody click. It was great. We all were very supportive of each other and had similar senses of humor and hanging out with them was actually a real joy. I hope we stay in touch for many years to come because I've learned a lot from them and it was so exciting to see what everyone was making throughout the residency. And I think the selections committee did a great job pairing us all together. My work is inspired by neuroscience, architecture, how people perceive the world around them and the patterns created when many people live in one environment. The work I did for this residency was an attempt to get my sculptures more connected with my drawings because I feel like my drawings are at a point where I have a lot of command over them. And my sculptures, I've always felt like I'm trying to find my voice in them. So through layering many geometric planes, coloring them and creating windows, putting light behind them, I was able to make something that was similar to my drawings in that way. This was actually the first time that I experimented with this type of work, and the residency allowed me to do that, especially working at NextFab, where there is more technological equipment than there would have been at the University of the Arts. They have a standard wood shop and metal shop, but they also have an electronic studio, laser cutters, CNC routers, water jets. They have a lot more equipment that you can use with CAD drawing and new technology. That allowed me to create a lot of these complex panels. The materials I worked with are eighth inch plywood, laser cut, and then painted. So they have a quality that doesn't look like wood. And then there was layered paper within those geometries. Depending on which layer there are and how many layers of paper, it changes the amount of light that comes through. And some of them had color as well, so then that adds another layer of complexity to it. And then they are mounted on light boxes wired with LEDs and light diffusing plexiglass. So that creates the glowing interiors of them. 
they almost have a stained glass quality to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that wasn't actually the intent, but it turned out to look a lot like that. But in my drawings, a lot of the time, I have windows where you're in a dark space looking out and there's light coming into a darker space. So I wanted to be able to bring that into a three-dimensional space. And I think when you look at my drawings and the sculptures next to each other, you can see that there is a huge parallel between the two. Your drawings and your sculptures are very complex, grid-like. What draws you to that type of design? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if it's like OCD or I saw, I, it's like an obsessive quality that I have. Just I love windows. I love structures. I've always been drawn to architecture, and that's why I worked in architecture for several years. I like the built space, the, the human constructed space. And I love old spaces that have a lot of entropy and patina of age on them because every single window has a different hue because of grime or some of them are broken or are missing or covered with cardboard. It creates these really interesting patterns within a uniform shape and structure. Hi, I'm Jason Schneider from New Jersey. I am an artist and woodturner. I work primarily with cardboard corrugated cardboard and most of the work revolves around the lathe. I also use some other woodworking equipment so I approach the material as a woodworker would using the bandsaw, table saw, lathe, a chainsaw. I make functional forms, sculptural forms and uh, some two-dimensional work as well. In this show there's some functional things and they do function even though they are cardboard but the majority of it is sculptural work. I would have imagined if you put a piece of cardboard on a lathe, it would disintegrate within a second. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be surprised how strong it is once you start to laminate, start to glue layer by layer. It gets really strong. The only thing is you need really sharp tools. So when I turn, I line up about six or seven tools, sharp tools. After I use a tool for about a minute or so, I know it lost its edge. It can still cut the cardboard, but it won't give me that clean cut that I'm after. So it's a constant back and forth to the grinder to sharpen the tools. Your pieces are so complicated. It looks like there are hundreds of layers. Do they take a long time? Some do, while others might not. I'm looking over there at one of the discs that I've made, and it was the most time-consuming piece. It's segmented, where the corrugations are going in all different directions. It's like patchwork. The turning of it went quick, but the preparation of the blank took a very long time. Yeah, and as you walk past it, you can see in many different angles, you can see through the corrugations. You know, so parts of it disappear at different times, you know. I noticed one of your pieces had cardboard and plaster. How do you combine those two? Yeah, well, I wanted a contrast between the brown corrugated material and uh, what better than a white plaster. And so I apply the plaster after the form is turned and sanded. And so then I'll go in and I'll use spackling knives and things like that, rubber gloves, and push it into the corrugations and sand it back. It usually gives a really nice surface where people don't quite know what it is. Sometimes they think it's like um, weathered wood or something like that. It's nice to have them get tricked by that material. <laughs> I've known about this residency since I started woodworking in 97. My first wood turning instructor brought us out to visit the program. And so I've known about it for a very long time. I finally had the opportunity to apply and get in. and. I was really excited based on what I've seen in the past and the work that comes out of it. Of course, this year we were at the next fab location, the Makerspace, and we adapted. And when we first started here, we did the Echo Lake, the collaboration over at Bucks Community College. And then we went to Washington to visit all these wonderful collections. And so we spent so much time together and it just continued straight through the residency in the dormitory. We always dine together and go out for drinks together. And so anyway, it's been great. Hi, my name is Anastasia Lido, and I'm from the College for Creative Studies in Detroit, Michigan. How did you hear about the residency? Uh, last year when I was in Philadelphia for the Furniture Society Conference, uh, I came to the Center for Art and Wood. Uh, and then when I went to their website to try and learn more about them, I found out about the program. 
A lot of my work that I've been doing at the residency involves relationships, connectivity, and trying to represent individuality. The main concept that I've been working with is this idea of looking up. It's something really simple that everybody does, but no one really ever thinks about. It connects people and it makes us all the same, even though we're all unique and individual. I wanted to create this environment where people could come together and be in this close proximity with each other and all be able to experience looking up. From there, they could think about why they look up, what it means to them, what feelings that they get from it. The standing pieces remind me a little bit of both chairs and buildings. Was that intentional on your part? Yes and no. Subconsciously <laughs> intentional. I'm trained as a furniture maker. That's the program that I'm studying in school. It's called art furniture. My woodworking skills are more furniture based, so that's why you see a lot of spindle connections, legs, mortise and tenons, that kind of joinery. For me, furniture is very important as far as the relationship that people have with their furniture and functional objects in general. So I do, when I'm making sculptural work, tend to try and stick to that kind of representation. Being at the ITE program, there's so much collaboration and interaction going on between all of the artists. That was something that I felt was really important to try and represent at the show. So I had asked everybody to submit writing to me on what looking up meant to them. I rearranged the words so that they were a little bit more graphically interesting to read and arranged them in frames that I had made as well. Do you let the viewers know which resident wrote which thing? No, I don't. They're all anonymous. And I think that the anonymity gives this sense of mystery, like people can try and figure out which resident wrote which one. Also, not having a name attached to it allows people to connect with the writing that they really connect with. Instead of saying, oh, this is Max's, and I like Max, so I connect with his writing, it gives it more of this blank slate and this fresh start for that relationship to develop. Because in reading, writing from a resident that maybe you didn't really know that well, you can learn a lot about them not having that preconceived notion already. I'm really trying to allow people to have this relationship with themselves on a personal level and learning more about themselves and their experiences, but also other viewers, us as the residents, and creating a stronger connection between me and my fellow residents. Daniel Fishkin, instrument builder, composer, sound artist, woodworker. Like a lot of musicians, I suffer hearing damage, but unlike a lot of musicians, it really interferes with the way that I will do music. It's hard for me to experience sound for extended durations without getting fatigue. There's also a lot of emotional distress. I get upset that music hurts me. So I try to find many different ways to do music, and one of the ways is to build instruments. Because when I'm building an instrument, I'm controlling the sounds that come out of it, and I really think that's composing. I worked on two projects, both building instruments not invented by me. One is called the Daxophone, which was invented in 1987 by a font designer and instrument builder named Hans Reichel. It's kind of like a musical saw, a thin piece of hardwood that's played with a bow, an ordinary cello bow. Using different woods or different shapes, you can bring out different characteristics of the material. So the, the thin piece of wood is bowed and set into motion and makes this wonderful little animal growling, squealing sound. It can sound like a trumpet, a violin, a baby, a warthog. I have been playing this instrument since about 2005, but I've never had the chance to do a systematic study of the instrument. Meaning, I wanted to change aspects of the design, invent my own things, try things out, build hundreds of tongues, and break them and see how thin can I make it, how soft can I make it, how gritty can I make it, how polished can I make it. So for the installation, I ended up making 80 or so tongues. They're all different, but I realized no one would know what it sounds like, so I made four crude daxophones that could be clamped to a table made out of a piece of wet oak. There's a bow and some playing instruments and anyone can walk up to it and make a sound and, and get that this isn't just visual art.
And the solar sounders are sunlight powered instruments, synthesizers without knobs. And instead of turning knobs to play the synthesizer, you turn the angle of the piece of wood and as sunlight hits the panel in different ways, it changes the pitch. They don't quite work inside, and that was intentional. I made a little shelter for them to sleep, but anyone in the museum can take one of these solar sounders under the careful guiding of a docent, take them outside and hear what type of music they make.